creep show art, a name and a story that is almost inspirational to tell. A story about a young homeless woman living out of her car and making it big through YouTube in a way that would both allow her to showcase her art and discuss what was on her mind. At her peak, she was almost a trendsetter and inspired various other art commentary channels. She was set to grow and become one of the largest and most beloved commentators. This was a dream, a reward for a difficult life realized through this channel. But even faster than it was propped up, it was torn down, with possibly the fastest subscriber loss percentage-wise seen on any YouTube channel. This all began with a conspiracy that she may have been leaking greater secrets through a popular online forum, which was then amplified by serious allegations that she and her significant other had been terrorizing a woman for over eight years. The quicker it piled on and the louder the voices grew against her, the madder she became with a past that was never supposed to be known, which was exposed by a community that she helped create and inspire to show how it unraveled and eventually led her to writing a 112-page document, we will go through the rise and fall of Creepshow Art. This video is brought to you by Manscaped.com, the global brand for men's grooming and hygiene products. But as you can see in the back of there on my bed, Manscaped sent me the Performance Package 4.0, which comes with a lot more than I actually expected. Um, Whenever I opened the package, I was like really surprised with the amount of stuff. I mean, not just inside the main package where this little nifty tool came in, but it also came with a nose trimmer and various other grooming tools alongside it. So, you know, that was a nice, pleasant, uh, that was a nice, pleasant addition to all that. Another like nifty feature is if you hold it three times, it doesn't turn on. And the reason it is that is because let's say you're traveling or what have you, uh, you don't want this going off in your bag. So it has that feature just in case, and to turn it back on, we hit it three times. So grab this product and help support the channel by going to manscaped.com today and get 20% off with free international shipping plus two free gifts when you use promo code JUNE at checkout. Link in the description. To begin the story, it would be impossible to start from Creepshow Art's first available video. The reason being is that there are several deleted videos made prior to this one that play a significant role in her channel's development. Luckily for us, a playlist exists containing some of these deleted videos. Looking through these gives us an idea of the content that popularized her channel, which are storytime videos. A familiar format that was popular at the time, with well-known content creators like Tana Mojo and Gabby Hanna raking in millions of views per video, talking about personal events in their lives told from a dramatized perspective. The twist, or what made Creepshow Art's videos different, was the narration of the story time was done over footage of her drawing. While this exact style of video, initially titled Sketchbook Storytime, was different from the popular Storytime variants, it had already been done by another channel going by the name of Emily Artful, dating as far as two years back. So the genre, nor the name, was truly unique to Creepshow Art. However, that's not to say that the video's contents were not significantly different. Well, at least the context around the surroundings is more telling in Creepshow Art's video as the tables seen in the background seemingly change this color or even texture throughout every story time. While a simple explanation could be that she is using different surfaces around her house, an accurate explanation is that at this point in time, Creepshow Art, or Shannon, was homeless. And these tables are either from Starbucks, Taco Bell, or her local library all primary areas that allowed a comfortable environment and a place with both Wi-Fi and outlets to charge her devices. To expand on this process, or the way she'd make these videos, we will need to also go through the way she was making it through life, at least in her words. After dropping out of college and later leaving a job due to a customer assaulting her, her parents pushed her to move out of their house, which then her and her then-boyfriend made the pre-planned decision to leave their hometown of San Jose for Portland up north. They knew that they would be living out of the cars until they could find some stability through work. This issue became much more apparent when they realized that they just exchanged one city with a high cost of living to another of a similar status. It should be noted that jobs were a bit harder to get as they are now, especially in Oregon that allows employers to deny applicants based on their credit history. And being that Shannon had debt and terrible credit history, these jobs did not come easy. 
Even trying to get them was quite expensive as some charged application fees of around $50. So you would need to get a job to apply to other half-decent jobs. And whenever you got rejected from an application, not only did you lose your time, but you also lost what little money you had. With the worst of this coming when on a single day, she was rejected from four jobs, which as she claims, she paid for all four applications, meaning she lost around $200 in one day through this at a point where money did not come easy. Because some aspects with being homeless are significantly more expensive than actually having a home. Food came from prepackaged meals from Walmart or inexpensive fast food restaurants like Taco Bell. Water came from bottled water or free cups of water supplied by places like Starbucks. Optimally, you'd have a fridge or pantry that could store cheaper or bulkier foods. But that isn't always an option when living out of a car. For hygiene, she took advantage of a gym membership that allowed access to showers. And because gas was and still is expensive, it was not feasible to charge her car by leaving it running. That's where a high-end jump starter kit that she got from her job working at a storage facility came in. With some of these kits, you can plug them into an outlet, let it charge, take it back to your car and charge your car. But they also come with USB ports and outlets within themselves. So through this jump starter kit, not only was she able to charge her car, she was also able to keep her phone and laptop charged for three days straight. With these living arrangements, there weren't many options when it came to how she could record these videos. So to break down the process, she would record herself drawing at one of the aforementioned locations, record the narration through her phone, typically recorded in her car, and then upload it whenever she returned to Starbucks. Considering this and that it was the earliest form of her current day content, there is no arguing that these videos are very weak. Not so much in the technical side as she did extremely well with what she had available to her, but rather in the storytelling side, where she could draw out an event where she fell in a gym shower and exposed herself to a stranger into an 18 minute long video repeating and prolonging events, framing it in a very negative or embarrassing way. As for the storytelling, she was a novice in the field, and it's hardly an easy thing to tell or know how to format a story to strangers, which is why her videos are littered with constant pauses shared with the dead air that came with it. Something else mostly unique to her content is the way she opened these videos usually had a heavy inflection on I, 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 or heard unique phrases like human person. As her content progressed, some of these aspects improved, but others never changed. Maybe her lack of speaking in a formal manner and accepting these quirks made her even more relatable to her viewers that constantly reflected that sentiment in her comment section. A comment section that would often also discuss her drawing process. As for the framing of these situations, sifting through several videos can give us an idea of how Shannon perceives the world, as we learn she is a stubborn asshole, as that is exactly what she calls herself. I am the most stubborn person in the f***ing world. We also learned that she wasn't the most popular person in school as that was a focal point for many of her early storytime videos that also went in depth with how she was bullied and mentions of getting into fights. It could have been this, alongside other negative events that took place in her life that made her an outwardly neurotic person. As she also says that she is a lazy glutton that loves attention and hates being around people. I am a lazy glutton who loves attention but hates being around people. She also considers herself as not a good person. But this could also be the spice that allowed her videos to excel as negative stories are typically more impactful than positive ones. But a big aspect about storytime videos is that they usually only perform well when the story is extremely absurd or it is being told by an established figure. Neither of those fit Creepshow's videos, and a big part of starting a channel is having that initial audience to watch your videos to help them get into the algorithm. Which is where PewDiePie comes in, but not in the way you would expect. You see, Creepshow Art, during the time she was creating these story times, also did a quick fan art of PewDiePie and posted it on her Instagram. That's when Suki, PewDiePie's wife's clothing brand, took note of the fan art and reposted it to their page, crediting Creepshow Art in the post. 
This gave Creepshow's Instagram a boost in followers, which is when she took the opportunity to shout out her YouTube channel for all her new followers to see, which gave her well over 100 subscribers. Now with this initial viewer base, growth was going to be much easier, especially combined with her constantly watching her own videos on repeat to possibly get them pushed more into the algorithm. And this eventually paid off with a different type of storytime video titled Tumblr Hates Artists. She starts the story with her ties with Tumblr, stating that beyond running a page that had 2,000 followers centered around the Jonas Brothers, she also had her own page that was much less popular where she posted her art. She goes on to say that her art was constantly ridiculed by SJWs and snowflakes, as she describes them. To her, this was a sort of gatekeeping that was happening, as when she would post her art on there, these people would flood the comments, attacking her art by saying she was trying to capitalize on the LGBT community, or when she drew a person of color, they would criticize her on being white and trying to capitalize on drawing a race that she didn't understand because it wasn't her own. It didn't take long before this video surpassed 200,000 views, and also encouraged an increase in subscribers, surpassing 1,000 shortly after it was uploaded which, according to Shannon, was a very bittersweet moment. Because that same day, she was approached by a police officer that requested that she move her car from a business's parking lot. A typical event in her life made more significant now when contrasted with such an achievement. Regardless, the success of this video did more than give her a boost in views or a boost in subs. It gave her a clear pathway to success, as these videos, heavy with conflict, had a significantly better pacing than one of her storytime videos. Maybe the anger or passion to share a story about a well-known site that frustrated her allowed her to speak with an interest that equally captivated her audience. But there is more to it. Her personal stories, at times, were just that. Personal. But when she discussed a controversial topic or figure in her videos, it made it that much more accessible to an audience hoping to learn more about any which situation. This is commentary, and there is no shortage of channels in this genre, with many channels taking inspiration from one another. A large inspiration for her was the then, not banned, Leafy is here, who gained millions of subscribers and dollars alike through talking about various events and videos that inspired many clones that tried to do the same thing. The grander difference is that Creepshow Art attracted a more feminine audience that was in between the audience of a commentary channel, like Leafy, and a tea channel, which is a genre on YouTube where it's taking a bit more of an emotional and biased approach. These channels, at least current day, are looked upon with a bit of disdain from creators in the commentary community as many of them have been called out for their lack of research by talking about controversies at face value. Regardless, it didn't take long for there to be another significant change in content. Now instead of a bird's eye view of her drawing on a table, the footage was now of art being created digitally from what seems to be an iPad, which would grow to be a staple of her and many other channels. This can be seen as an investment towards her content, and a goal to improve. But in her personal life, she had another goal that would change her life entirely. And to do this, alongside YouTube and her current job, she had to get another job. But once achieved, with the various sources of income, her and her boyfriend were finally able to afford an apartment in what seems to be less than a year since she began uploading her commentary videos. Which, as some creators typically maintain a schedule, her uploads could be described as sporadic, sometimes uploading twice a week or several times back to back so her upload schedule may purely be determined by her motivation and what drama was popular at the time. But even more inconsistent were the amount of views her videos were getting. Some got 12,000, then 40,000, then 200,000, then 20,000 again. Though it's not very strong, it does again solidify two things. Her viewers had very little interest in her how-to videos or other experimental content like this animation that performed poorly at least when put alongside her other videos. The other thing this inconsistency shows us is that she was able to bring many new viewers that would later turn into subscribers around this time, as typically even your worst performing video is able to hit a minimum threshold, or at least your views would be able to see a more of a static average that could normalize the amount of views that you were getting. But the variety of dramas and topics she talked about hit various different parts of the algorithm, bringing in new subscribers that may have followed her for many different topics. Though this is bad if you want consistency and stability in your channel, 
Multiple lures cast in different ponds meant that she was catching different viewers from different genres, and because so many new people were introduced to her this way, her channel grew faster than your typical channel would. So about a year since she uploaded her sketchbook storytime videos, she was already at 76,000 subscribers. And nine months later, by the end of 2019, she about doubled that at 150,000 setting this year as one where she successfully integrated into the YouTube environment and took on many common activities in that field like having sponsorships and having both positive and negative interactions with other channels. Interactions like disapproving of channels that were usually in a negative spotlight at the time she made her video, or collaborating with channels on and off her channel. There was also a little bit of giving back to the community. Initially this was done by Creep of the Week, a segment where at the end of the video she showcased a selected artist's creations mainly seen in videos in 2018. But in 2019 this was taken to a whole new level that could equally benefit her and other artists. Gas. Would you ever start showing people's fan art at the end of your videos? Oh, bitch, now I'm using their speed paints in their videos, so ha ch ha cha 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 you want to see your speed paint in one of my videos, or your anything, any video you want to play under my fucking voice, uh, send me an email at creepshowvideos at gmail.com. Instead of her doing the art in her videos, sometimes she'd have fans send her footage of their digital speed paints and have that used as the base of many videos. So she was able to streamline her content more by not needing to draw, and in exchange, these artists would get some exposure. Some may view this as lazy, but some may view this as efficient. Still, not all her content was improving, at least in the traditional sense, as her audio was getting noticeably worse, which is strange enough because this was after she was investing money into a microphone. Specifically, the blue snowball microphone as seen per her video's description. Maybe it was that she just wasn't close enough to the microphone itself. While one could argue that she didn't care about the audio quality and the microphone was more convenient than using her phone to record audio, then why would she later invest hundreds of dollars into a Rode Procaster where even then the audio quality is poor? And actually, when she was homeless recording on an iPhone in her car, that audio sounds leagues better than practically any of the videos on her channel. Hey assholes, it's Shannon. What Trisha did back then was kind of everything. Come to me and ask me, a YouTuber, to insert myself. But if anything, this drop in quality just shows how unimportant it was. It does not matter what footage she was using or how her audio quality was degrading. It matters that her storytelling and pacing of these commentaries, dramas, or beefs that she was intertwined with were getting easier to follow as her channel was growing. So jumping into 2020 after experimenting with various topics, there was a noticeable stabilization of topics and consistency of views as her channel developed into topics that were popular with T-channels where it was popular to discuss figures like Onision, Social Repose, Jeffree Star, Davi Vanity, Shane Dawson, James Charles, Blair White, and many other controversial figures that had overlapping viewer bases. Like other channels that discuss these figures, Shannon was not exempt from getting some key details wrong when researching these stories. There was also a small but growing sentiment in her community displeased at her approaching some of these situations more emotionally than before. Or even now, the storytelling seemed to go down in quality, specifically in terms of accuracy. Compiling some of these complaints spread across Shannon's videos was Toby, a small channel that had previously made a video critiquing Shannon's video where she talked about content creator Jacqueline Hill's estranged father who was a public figure in the form of a minister, and poked fun of him while also connecting potential personality traits between the two. The problem came with lines like this. This is insane to me, and it's even more insane to me that Jacqueline, despite being apparently estranged from him since about 2012, has never mentioned this. She has talked about her and her family and how they used to travel to Africa and she traveled so much when she was younger and she's talked about how they went there like nine times, but never once, never once has she talked about doing it because her father convinced a group of people in Africa that he was God and could cure them of any disease like AIDS. She never said that, ever. And I wonder why. I wonder if it's like, oh, that man probably taught you to lie. Shannon criticizing Jacqueline for never bringing up her strange father when talking about her life had many criticizing Shannon for not fully grasping what it meant to be estranged. Toby's video titled, My Issue with Creepshow Art's Jacqueline Hill Video Don't Hate Me Uwu, released on March 22nd, 2020, dissecting this point and many other smaller ones in Shannon's video. 
and it performed well. So a little over two months later, Toby released another video on June 9th, 2020, titled The Faults of Creepshow Art. Many of the points discussed in this video are mostly based on Shannon not fully and or in properly researching her topics along with the way she handled some controversial aspects of them. As Toby claims, this was done not purely to showcase Shannon's weak points, but rather to bring notice to a pattern that could be soon playing in her content, not unlike what many T-channels are known for. We'll quickly skim through these criticisms by breaking them down to five points, four of which are focused on videos. Number one, Shannon previously covered and announced an artist who was known for drawing sexual imagery of minors, but in order to get support to flag the content, Shannon linked the artist's post in her description, which even though her intention was to direct viewers to flag it, no matter the intention, she was still linking that content in her description, which some saw as immoral. Number two, during a situation where two well-known drag queens shared what they presumed to be real sex messages that implicated a content creator that Shannon was in favor of, Shannon covered this situation. But instead of sexting messages, she grossly misspoke and said that there were also nudes of a minor involved, which there wasn't. When called out on Twitter directly, she denied that she said such a thing, only to have her saying that exact thing thrown back at her. Number three. Jacqueline Hill, which we already discussed. So, number four, mislabeling a previous anti-vaxxer that she was having a feud with as a current anti-vax defender. And finally, number five, was Toby worrying that this could become a pattern and that Shannon needs to not change for the worst and do her best to research her topics. Her content and how she behaves and reacts to people online has increasingly gotten more defensive, more childish, more petty, and significantly more emotionally driven without any control over what she says or what she does. And it's extremely negligent and it's not okay. Every single comment you don't like, you don't need to respond. You need to learn when to leave things alone and when things need to be addressed. You have a very impressionable audience, Shannon. And what you say and how you react to things does matter. You also need to start scripting your videos and take more time for them to come out, not just popping one out every other day. A day later, Shannon responded to Toby's video with her own video titled Acknowledging My Faults, which received mixed reactions from her audience. While Shannon accepts that she made a mistake when linking her viewers to sexualized art of minors, even though the intention in doing so was to have it reported, she also accepts and agrees that she's going to do better when it came to the misinformation she was spreading about those two drag queens that only shared sex and not nudes about an alleged minor. She also shared a similar reaction with the Jacqueline video, but also defended herself on points that were not even argued. Regardless, she removed three out of the four videos where these issues arose from. Though a bigger issue with this video was a misinterpretation, or how some viewers saw it as deflecting on point five, where Toby says she doesn't want to see Shannon change and become lazy with her content or become more emotional with it in a way that forgoes research and welcomes misinformation and angry responses to those that she disagrees with, but Shannon took this criticism a different way. However, I do not and do not want to go back to the person I was when I made those videos because I was having panic attacks every night in my car, hurting myself, and uh, there is so much more that I, I can't, I can't go back to that person. And I just wanted to say that right now because in this video, which isn't wrong by the way, I'm not trying to do anything. like. The, in this video, there are a couple of times where Toby says that they liked how I used to be and they liked the older content that I made and that I should go back to doing that. And the issue is that I don't. I don't like it. And I just want to say that now that I'm not going to be going back to that because I'm not that same person. When Toby said that she didn't want to see her change, Shannon understood this as a request to revert to the person she was the year prior, where she says she was in a much worse place and is not willing to become that person again. Though the criticisms were targeting her getting lazier in the researching process and not truly how she changed in her personal life. This was something that was echoed through the comments section of her video and it wouldn't be the last time Shannon was accused of what some would consider to be deflection. But unlike this drama, the next one was extremely convoluted. Because as it progressed, more and more creators got involved creating their own dramas that were separate entities that could be tied to a point of origin to this main one surrounding Toby, which is the person that made the faults of Creepshow video. Toby now was being criticized for liking Shane Dawson along with other media points. 
Then other content creators jumped in to criticize those criticizing Toby, creating another layer, and another layer after this one, and many more that I possibly didn't account for. But to keep the story simple and easier to follow, we'll focus on the layer surrounding Shannon, or Creepshow Art. Or at least how she was roped into all of this. And that starts from content creator Prison Make Luke, who was in opposition of Toby, and other content creators joining the fray, like Hopeless Peaches. A content creator that was also in the art community that had taken opposition to Creepshow Art in the past, and also had some points in defense of Toby. Though out of this 23-minute video, Prison Make Luke released on November 6, 2020, the most impactful part, at least now, was a about two-minute long section talking about Hopeless Peaches. Here is that section. The person who commented was Hopeless Peaches, who also decided to put herself into the drama despite constantly saying how she doesn't want to be in it and would just never leave it alone. And when people like Thumbin called her out for her terrible and biased behavior, she made a community post about how she wasn't friends with Toby, which I didn't actually know she wasn't friends with Toby because she did everything in her power to defend her and fail to fight Omnia so much that I thought she was. Because why go through all that hassle for someone you apparently don't even care about? Well, you say, are you going to be taking a break from the drama? and comments and all that, which is fine. If you need a break, you need one. I'm not saying you don't have mental health problems, but you would constantly come back to post more things than beg for sympathy. And when you were getting genuine criticism for all the garbage you've done, you decided to suicide bait your audience, going off the grid for hours to make your audience worry that you hurt or killed yourself. And guess what? Two days later, you were back to making treats again. And she's been doing this for a long time. It's very manipulative, and she's always using her mental health as a pity me card, which is funny since she called out Toby for doing the same thing. It's it's very scummy, and it says a lot about her as a person. Like, how little do you have to care about your audience to do that to them? And when you don't want to deal with the criticism, you say your mental health is acting up again, and how you're going to get away from social media, but when it goes away, you come right back to it. It's scummy, and your audience deserves better. While it wasn't initially noticed by a large portion of viewers, this section had a severe accusation against Hopeless Peaches, which also dangerously assumed the intent with a very controversial topic. Luke assumed the intent that Hopeless Peaches jumped into this drama, but was unable to take the backlash and faked her feelings about ending her life. Or at least had some evidence of that, as Peaches jumped back to tweeting soon after she posted that goodbye tweet, which worried her fans and is something that she later apologized for. Regardless, what Luke failed to consider is that this drama and her mental health issues were two events that were not intertwined, and that Peaches, according to her and her friends, the night of that tweet was very close to ending her life, which was something Luke did not know, but now it was too late. Out of all the points he made in this video and videos prior, this is the one that would now stand out the most. This is when Peaches took to her community section on YouTube to address these accusations and also to Twitter where she DM'd Luke directly. And because this situation was becoming a larger problem due to Luke's initial video talking about Peaches, he made another one. This time with the focus being only on Peaches. In this video, he covered a variety of things Peaches had done, like subtweet Creepshow Art and softblock her, along with other unfavorable things to someone she used to be friends with. And that is how Creepshow was dragged into all this. To provide some more context behind the history of Creepshow and Peaches, Peaches was a fan of Creepshow when she was first starting out. And when they came into contact through Twitter DMs, Creepshow helped Peaches in many ways, like giving her a video slot on Creepshow's channel to promote her own. But shortly after they had a falling out, due to Peaches subtweeting Creepshow, softlocking her, and privately DMing her about a video she did not like of hers, which then soured their relationship. But this was never extremely public, at least not in the level it was going to be, as both Creepshow and another large content creator who had a falling out with Peaches both commented on this video. And so a pseudo-alliance was formed in opposition to Peaches. More just five days after Luke's first video directly aimed at Peaches, Creepshow released hers titled Hopeless Peaches Needs to Stop, released on December 7th, 2020. This video eventually got nearly a million views, and with other videos coming out against Peaches, this no doubt affected the like to dislike ratio of Peaches' response that was posted the following day. A response that Peaches herself, after evaluating it, found it to be flawed, which is why she deleted the video. This causing almost no initial backlash towards Creepshow. But this, alongside other events, were creating divides in the community. These divides are not something to fear if you're a respected or influential member within the community. 
But if you're not, or at least made many enemies that fear speaking out against you, it can be quite dangerous to misstep or create any opening that will allow these creators to pull the rug from under you. And if they're trying to, ultimately you want to get in front of the controversy and address whatever arguments they have against you before they do, and that can be in part attributed to audience retention or level of investment in time that the audience needs or is willing to put in to understand a situation. We can apply this to a 38-page document that was created in defense of Hopeless Peaches that Shannon responded to on February 3, 2021. The first 19 pages address Luke and his three major videos mentioning Peaches. The following 15 pages are about Shannon and her videos against Peaches, and the last three bring up another creator involved in the mix known as Camila Cuevas, along with a conclusion to the document. Reading this document, while every now and then returning to some material referenced in the document, took about two hours. So any which person may be faster or slower when going through this document. But if you're looking to read this document and also watch all the content mentioned within it that was directly involving Peaches, that will tack on another three hours, not counting the videos made after the release of this document or any other videos surrounding Toby's controversies. That is around a five-hour time investment that is streamlined to focus on hopeless Peaches. And the more time it takes, the more likely a key piece of information will be missed due to human error. That's also a lot to ask for not just the viewer, but the many content creators covering this situation. But even if you did understand it well, there are many pieces of the puzzle missing. There are also inflamed biases on both sides. Creepshow and Luke's video against Peaches runs with a false narrative that Peaches is a liar and backstabber amongst other things. As for the document, it was made by other content creators with the intention to give a fair look into Peaches' perspective. But due to its nature, it also has many biases. But it is still more fair than the side of Creepshows. And a massive part about both sides is that there are many areas that can be seen as miscommunication and also both sides lack many screenshots for their claims. But this is, again, mostly on Creepshow's side. Another issue is both sides make extreme accusations or apply labels to each other that fails to consider the other's intent. With, again, the majority of these accusations coming from Shannon herself misconstruing or extending the truth and reframing events much more often than others. The grander difference is that Peach's side of the story, or at least the document, acknowledges many of her faults and wrongdoings when handling the situation. But really, most of these extreme accusations leveled at one another do not matter, except for one. And that was Luke's accusation that Peaches was sympathy baiting when she was talking about ending her life. And at this point, it should be made clear that in no place and in no form, at least not made public, Shannon has defended this part of Luke's argument, and that many other content creators not relevant to this video have done arguably worse things to Peaches. But Creepshow is typically remembered as the worst due to her much larger following. And about 10 months ago, since the release of this video, Luke himself has left a comment apologizing for these claims. But because Luke and Shannon were in a sort of alliance against Peaches, these claims of sympathy baiting are for some, also Shannon's responsibility to denounce because she didn't acknowledge it and refute it. But then again, she did not reinforce it. Creepshow tried to step in front of the document with this video. And it worked. As this video was initially well received with 10,000 likes and 104 dislikes. But that was mostly from her core audience that will support her through most scenarios. Once Peaches released her video adding more information to the situation, showing how negatively Creepshow and others framed her, along with other videos coming out against Creepshow around a month-long window, and it reaching viewers that were not part of her core audience, meant that the dislikes began to pile on, and the like-to-dislike ratio lowered to 84%. But this was about the peak of Creepshow's hatred, and beyond other small dramas she was involved in, like a situation involving another content creator known as Hello Leash, who was feuding with content creator Gabby Hanna. And without any true opposition, there was a large promise of growth, but also a lingering feeling that her content was getting more and more lazy, which is a very dangerous concoction when combined with this growth. Because if you're a smaller channel, your claims hold less weight, not only due to your possible inexperience, but also because your videos are most likely reaching a smaller audience. There is less responsibility to hold if your claims are not widespread. But the inverse was the crisis that Creepshow was facing. There would have to be a massive change in her content, an effort to get stories accurate, or the backlash was going to be larger than the Peach situation or Toby's video highlighting her lack of research. But it wasn't that. There was something larger stewing that opened Pandora's box. 
a repainting and retelling of Shannon's character through accusations leveled against her. These so egregious that there was a period where they were too serious to be taken as real. But there were too many pieces that fell perfectly into place that now it seems too serious for these accusations to be considered improbable. This is the downfall of Shannon, one that we can not only pinpoint to the month, but also the day, hour, minute, and second. It all deriving from this post on Lolcow on June 2nd, 2021 at 7.23 p.m. and 19 seconds, posted by an administrator of the site that says, quote, as many users in this thread are aware, Shannon's posts on Lolcow haven't exactly been subtle. We've decided to compile their post history after she escalated her behavior by sharing her sister's social media in order to deflect from criticism towards herself. Beyond that, she has been anonymously promoting her videos and Patreon slash YouTube membership to farmers and making posts about herself to either white knight or insult herself. For many years, we've had a policy to reveal post histories of users who go to great lengths to use lolcow.farm to propel their own online presence. You can read the full post history here." Unquote. Before we look into the archive of Creepshow's post, we'll quickly go over what lolcow is. Lolcow, like Kiwi Farms, 4chan, and many others are generally looked down upon websites where users usually post anonymously. These sites typically have a forum format and are split into many threads about different subjects. What Lolcow specializes in, like the name suggests, are Lolcows or a public figure that is easy to annoy or harass and readily gives a response to negative attention. Doing so repeatedly is known as milking a Lolcow. The definition can change and be more vaguely applied to any public figure like Creepshow Art. And actually, this admin post can be found on a thread about Shannon herself that she was already allegedly posting on anonymously. This thread, though it is one of many talking about Creepshow Art, was only about 8 months old at the time. But Shannon's post history can be traced back to her first archive post dating back to November 30th, 2018. And now for the legitimacy of these posts. As mentioned by the admin, if it is Creepshow, she broke three and possibly more rules of the website depending on any which perspective. But we'll focus on the confirmed three, which are these three. Number eight, do not attempt to use lolcal.farm for attention or profit. Number nine, do not deceptively post about yourself in the third person for any reason. And number 10, do not advertise. Rules eight, nine, and 10 were broken several times by her but all of them can be pinned on one post where she posts about her own video that is only available for channel members, which means it is locked behind a paywall, and can be both considered for profit and advertisement, which breaks rules 8 and 10. And because she's posting about herself in the third person, it also breaks rule 9. The admins also mention that Shannon invaded her sister's privacy by sharing a previously unknown social media account, which is a form of doxing. But it is important to keep in mind that this is coming from a website that holds almost nothing but criticisms and often seeks to troll people. But also, in the past, this website has called out other figures successfully for doing the same thing Shannon allegedly was. Shannon's response to this on the community post section of her channel was strange to say the least. Few lines matter in this wall of text except this one that mentions two key pieces of information. First is that she confirms that her IP address was used to access Locale, but it is, according to Shannon, being spoofed by Amy, a name used by her as an alias for an alleged stalker that she has made several videos on. Shannon claims that this Amy person has been terrorizing her for over 10 years. But the Lolcow system admin, however, did not take kindly to this and divulged that it was not just based on her IP, but it was also based on her other devices used. The admins, or rather a singular system admin, may have bridged her identity by seeing her consistency of passwords. Though Lolcow is anonymous, there is an option to input a password to delete your own post, and some of this information is saved locally on Chrome and on your computer. And with this, they can possibly link posts to each other, but still not the person with 100% accuracy. Something else that may have allegedly helped is that the IP they have stored moved in relation to where Shannon moved. So they could have also aligned that with her timeline of moving from different areas like Portland to Vegas. This is to say that it would become increasingly more difficult to spoof her IP, as Shannon's alleged stalker would have had to hack the ISP itself, which is unlikely or hacked her Wi-Fi, which is also unlikely. 
even the most technically proficient stalker would have a difficulty pulling all this off, which makes it that much more believable that it was Shannon. But even if this was dismissed, there is still more evidence that points to Shannon posting these 292 posts on Lolcow. But before we get to that, we'll focus on the community reaction. Initially, or at least for the first day, this archive of posts went unnoticed with much attention being directed to what Shannon claims to be a hacking of her account. But all these alleged hackers did was change the background and profile picture to an equally harmless one and privated some items. Because of the lack of impact and no hacker coming out to lay claim to this attack, the community consensus is that she faked this hacking to hide information herself. But it didn't take long for the focus to now shift towards the local leaks, when on June 4th, a tweet showing some of these posts started garnering attention. This and the aforementioned lengthy and almost readily pre-prepared statement that Shannon released, consisting of 1,185 words, brought on more suspicion, as her statement could have been just a few sentences that denied the entire thing. But if at any point in the future her IP was grabbed through different means, the local administrators could verify that they are the same. Maybe they already did so. So that is a fear without right denying it. But if she comes out as the author of these posts, she will of course receive flack. So this is a middle ground between acceptance that it is her IP, with the denial that it was her by deflection to a alleged stalker. In doing so, Shannon is attempting to shift the narrative that she was the perpetrator to her now being the victim. And as for the local posts themselves, they are somewhat contradictory to the character that is Creepshow Art. While there are some posts that do align with her well, like where she describes the income of a content creator her size, claims to be a smaller content creator in the art community, and both praises and knocks herself down in the third person, that is not our focus with these posts. Our focus is that Creepshow Art stands as a supporter of the LGBTQ plus community, but in these posts uses slurs against them, namely the F and the T word. But it doesn't stop there as she also insults content creators that she's supposedly cordial with, like implying that Edwin Generations is a closeted homosexual, painting ready to glare in a negative light, and saying that D'Angelo Wallace is that content creator everyone pretends to like, though no one really does, then two weeks later after this exact post, she releases a video joking that she hates him, but says that she truly likes him and are actually good friends, and also calls him a soldier and a stallion in the description. There are many other examples of these contradictions in these posts, as well as leaking information that was shared to her by other content creators in confidence, that we won't delve into. The major takeaway of all this is that while many might not see posting on Locale as a problem, it's how contradictory and, frankly, two-faced she was in these posts that many take issue with. While internet personalities can differ how they are in their private lives, it is important to carry the same beliefs and ideologies on both sides, or your intent will usually be perceived in the worst way possible and your credibility will plummet, as there will be little trust in what you say. And now that this side of Shannon was exposed, we can now apply it to the drama with Hopeless Peaches and expand on some of the accusations. As just a few days after all this information came out, on June 11, 2021, Hopeless Peaches released a video titled, Speaking Up Against Creepshow Art, This Is Not Okay. This video reframing a lot of what transpired between the two creators over the past year. And she found within these posts that Shannon most likely had the intention to have a group of creators share her narrative and take Peaches down months before any of this drama transpired. That you made right after you dismissed my criticism, but you deleted your Twitter the day you started slandering me. Anyway, back to the messages. 10th of March 2020. Okay, so Peaches is just a snake. Creeps you even put her on a channel. What the hell? She's so overdramatic, she's making CSA look good, replies to herself, saying, So let me get this straight, this girl goes around befriending YouTubers, rips off their content, says exactly what they say in less interesting ways, and then, after that person puts them on their channel and asks their followers to follow this clone, she turns into a bitch? What a fucking cow. I want to figure out who else she's done this to because of how she talks, it can't just be Shannon. This is disgusting. Again, since this is of March of last year, unless your stalker Amy knew you were going to gather a group of people who hate me to expose me, this seems very fishy. 
There's also a later posting, when discussing another content creator, where Shannon allegedly says, quote, Anyone else find it weird that whenever these people are called out, they say they are going to kill themselves? Unquote. This post can also be in relation to what Hopeless Peaches was accused of. Peaches also goes into the emails that were exchanged between her and Shannon, which are about her sharing private messages with the group that made that 38-page document in defense of Peaches. But in Shannon's video addressing the document back in February of 2021, confidently claims that because these Instagram messages were shared, and somewhere within those messages Shannon shared her private number with Peaches, she concludes that everyone who worked on the document must have seen her private phone number, which is accusing Peaches of doxing, but also not giving any proper thought to how easy it is to black out any private information in any given screenshot. And the reality was only two screenshots of those Instagram messages were shared, none of which containing Shannon's phone number. After Peaches called her out on this, Shannon then leaves a comment below on her video saying that she never said Peaches doxed her. And though she is correct in the way she never said the word dox, she does manipulate the situation by misquoting the part of the video where she's accusing Peaches of doxing, by saying she said, that if the people who made the document had access to the full DMs, which I assume since they are comfortable speaking on what exactly was said in them, then they have seen my phone number. But in the video, she actually says this. If the people who had these screenshots literally scrolled up, which I cannot do because once again, Peaches blocked me after she realized I had access to this conversation and she didn't want that, you would see her literally falsely accusing another YouTuber, that being what the what again, of flagging her account and causing her to be unable to make money and be unable to support herself. I would love to see this document talk about the false accusations she leveled at him, seeing as apparently they have access to the entire conversation, but I guess not. Um, it also makes me feel entirely weird that all of these people have seen my private phone number, so that's fun. I love that. We are on page 29 now. Her comment frames it as an assumption when she was called out, while in the video she is confident that she was doxxed. This is all to show how heavily Shannon tries to frame things in her favor, and goes as far to say now that it's even worse that only two screenshots were shared and not the entire conversation. Beyond the framing, there is also the dangerous part of sharing such a lie of Peaches doxing her, as viewers, maybe less than 1% of this viewer base, may be unhinged and go off on this false doxing allegation to actually dox Peaches. Besides that, there is more to Peaches' video that provides further proof that it is Shannon making these posts on LolCow. For that, we'll have to give attention to this DM that wasn't made public until much later and when they were still on friendly terms. To explain this DM, Peaches contacted Creepshow saying that she felt that her video on content creator PK Russell was bully-like. Keeping in mind that these DMs were private, this person on LolCal, that Shannon claims is her alleged stalker, says only five days since the DMs this. Anyway, she replies with, I've become slightly intrigued by this, so here's what I can tell. Peaches got mad at Shannon a month or so ago because Shannon made a video on PK Russell where she said his criticism of Has Been Hotel didn't matter and that the people who criticised him were nitpicking. It's obvious she didn't watch the videos because she's lazy. She publicly said Shannon was being rude and didn't do enough research, but Shannon apologised publicly and somehow was praised for it by those she offended. Then this month, Shannon does this Jacqueline Hill video and she starts posting about being disappointed in her idol and saying shit like she's mudslinging, all while not tagging her idol, Shannon. Shannon seems unbothered or simply doesn't notice because she's redacted and posts that Woman's Day post about how they are friends and she's like a mini-me. This causes Peaches to freak out, unfollow her on both her private account and public account, and starts talking shit about her. Shannon notices and seems upset, but doesn't do anything. With this, there is now much information that directly opposes Creepshow's claims that it is her stalker doing all this, and this inability to take responsibility, as previously mentioned, destroys her credibility. And because this post was also tied to her stalker, it brings into question if she ever had one. If she can lie about this, what other things has she fabricated and for what reason would she lie about something as serious as having a stalker? To that is where we get into a new wave of accusations, that if proved true, would make her a criminal. This is where we get into the most discussed content creator of these locale leaks, who besides Shannon, is the earliest mentioned content creator that Shannon discussed on LolCow. 
That really doesn't say much. Until six days after the leak, Emily posted on Twitter claiming that Shannon is dating her ex-boyfriend. And together they have stalked, harassed, and threatened her and her children's lives, alongside using revenge P against her and her previous drug addiction against her as well to get her fired from her job. Emily's proof to this is whenever she traced her stalker's information back to them, it led to an IP where Shannon was located. She also says she has three phones and three laptops worth of evidence documenting much of this over the course of the last 10 years or so. With these damning claims getting much traction on Twitter, she was pressured into hurrying the production with her video on Shannon. Creepshow Has Always Been This Way is a two hour long video that released just four days after that large initial tweet against Shannon. Hi everyone, I'm Emily. If you're not familiar with who I am, I have been making art content here on YouTube for the past six years. For the majority of those six years and several years prior, I had been facing stalking, harassment, and threats from one very recognizable source. There is no doubt that aspects of the video are a bit drawn out and the organization isn't optimal, but this is dismissed as she was detailing a long event that caused her much trauma with a video that was developed in a four-day window. A large feed that gained an equal amount of traction that rewrites Shannon's story as we know it. And this begins in 2010. Also for the sake of brevity, we won't go too in depth with this video, though it is highly encouraged that you view it yourself. To start this timeline, this was before Emily or Shannon had a YouTube channel, as it takes place in 2010. During this time, Emily was abusing both prescription and illegal drugs and was overall a very toxic person. She was working as a gig musician in San Jose where she met Anthony and the two had a very toxic relationship. Emily goes on to describe what kind of person Anthony was back then. As beyond the toxicity of the relationship, Emily claims he would often punch holes in walls, talk about donning black trench coats with a friend and paying his old high school a visit with weaponry, and also talks about an event when she was high and immobile, Anthony was over and took advantage of the situation which means he effectively R-worded her. Then they broke up at a later point. Though for a while, they did have a small fling going back and forth before it was broken off entirely and replaced with a professional relationship for work purposes. A key point is when they broke up, Emily went to Anthony's work to see him, which is also where Shannon worked, a person she really didn't know at the time. So with that, we know that Shannon was now dating Emily's ex. But Emily, being the last and favorable person she was, while Shannon and Anthony were dating, Anthony sent over a track that she was working on to Emily where she ridiculed the woman's vocals that were already on it, convincing Anthony to replace that spot with herself. Is Shannon's. And I say, man, that girl's voice is weak. It doesn't sound good on the track. My voice would sound so much better. Super catty, super bitchy, and super insecure, immature. There's a million words I could use for what I said about it. So I put Shannon down to raise myself up. And I, I believe in doing that, that is what set off set off this chain of events, the stalking, the harassment, the, the threats. So I made that comment. After this event, she began getting demeaning messages across her social medias but also, strangely enough, an increase in Facebook friend requests from strangers. To volume in them. Something else I noticed kind of uh, retroactively uh, was that I was receiving a lot of Facebook friend requests from people that I didn't know, but I would have like a handful of mutual friends with. So I would, of course, accept these requests. And um, these were coming from Andrew. Now, they ended up phishing me and locking me out of that original Facebook account. Now, I had had that original Facebook account since I was a minor, since Facebook came out. Um, and hidden in the messages of that account um, were some compromising photographs. Now, most of them were of me as an adult, but unfortunately, um, there were a few of me as a minor. And I tried to express that to my stalker several times, but they just disregarded it and said that I was a liar, um, which was infuriating and um, deeply upsetting and traumatizing. And what did they do with these photographs? Well, they went ahead and put them into a photo bucket account, as well as some other photographs um, from a website that I was on. 
Um, at this point, I was doing um, some webcamming, um, not exactly something that I was doing um, of my own free will. A lot of that wasn't, but that's not Andrew and Shannon's fault, but they compiled a bunch of photographs, inappropriate photographs of me in this photo bucket account and just taunted me with them. And um, I didn't really have control of much. I tried to get a regular job and um, Andrew and potentially Shannon found out about this regular job and decided to email my job and send them a compromising video of myself. They they posed as a client, said, I'm a regular client. You've lost my business because look at your, you know, disgusting human being of a receptionist. Um, now, I am going to try and get in touch with this job to confirm that they did fire me because they received this email. Looks like they've had a change in business name, but I think that um, that will be a very important receipt, so I'm really going to try hard to get that. Anytime I had control of my life in any way, they would try desperately to take it away from me. I have tried to turn my emotions off this whole time, but I can't hear. They wanted me, they wanted me destroyed. Any good thing that I could have, they, they wanted it destroyed. And anytime I saw that light, they would snuff out that light so fucking fast. And that is not even the worst of it. I'm going to compose myself <clears throat> and come back. So after this happened, I, I went into a really dark downward spiral. There was a lot um, that was very difficult for me uh, that I had to overcome pretty much completely on my own. Um, but then once I did overcome it, I ended up meeting someone, um, moving in with them and getting a different job. Um, and again, you know, Andrew and potentially maybe Shannon uh, did everything they could to try to find out where I was working. For some reason, they knew it was at a restaurant, a specific type of restaurant. So they literally like copied exactly one of my friend's Facebook accounts, took the, the about information, all of their pictures, and made this other Facebook account and acted like, oop, my Facebook got deleted, Emily. Like, can you add me again? And my dumb ass was like, okay. And so, oh my God, I just, I want to scream at my past self. But I accepted the friend request. And then, of course, they post, hey, does anybody know of any really cool, this specific type of cuisine restaurants in this specific location? And at that point, I'm like, you are not my friend. And so I blocked them. I knew right away that they were trying to find out where I worked. From this point onward, we get into Emily's channel within the timeline, specifically three years after its establishment. In reference, this video, my video that you're watching right now, began documenting Shannon in 2015. So at this point in time, in 2018, she was on year three of being homeless. And while she created her channel shortly after Emily's channel in 2016, she really began posting in 2018. So that is the year that we're currently at, and also when Emily becomes aware of another art channel known as Creepshow Art, and notices that she also labels her videos as sketchbook story times, and wanting to protect the title of her series, she reached out to her. It wasn't like this much larger channel. I was still quite a small channel. Um, so when I approached her and I sent her a private message, I was perfectly polite. I didn't want to feel like I was like coming in here and trying to intimidate her to get her to change her series name. 
Hi, Shannon. My name is Emily, and I have a channel on YouTube called Emily Artful. It's been brought to my attention that you have a series with the exact same name as a series I created three years ago called Sketchbook Storytime. I'm going to guess this was most likely 100% by accident or by coincidence, but I put my heart and soul into my series, and I'd really, really appreciate it if you were able to change the name of your Storytime videos. You are completely within your right not to, as it's your channel, and you can do with it as you please. But from one artist to another, I hope you'll understand how it can hurt my business. I love your art, and it's obvious you're very talented. You've got an incredibly unique style. I've never seen anything like it. I hope you understand my request, and I hope you don't think I'm angry. Things like this happen all the time. I figure it's just a coincidence. Thank you, Emily. And Shannon responded, Sorry, man, I watched Lehman Raptor on YouTube, and she has a series titled the same name, and she gave me a go-ahead. I'll just label them as story time, since that's all it is, but I appreciate you letting me know your concern. Looking into it, there are quite a few accounts using the same name for similar series. Kind of like Get Ready For Me, for beauty YouTubers almost. I think at the very least you might have started a trend, which is commendable. Sorry I made you uncomfortable in any way, my dude. That was the first interaction between Emily and Creepshow, who she didn't know was Shannon at the time. On the topic of Emily's channel, in the past, she was getting tweets from Anthony directly claiming she was buying views on a video that performed well. And at the same time, she was getting the same style of accusations directly from an account called Non-Viral Emily that was established purely to harass her. Remember after Anthony was tweeting at me accusing me of buying subscribers, only moments later did a sock puppet account accuse me of the same thing. Nobody else did just Anthony and the sock puppet account. And you can see that I was reacting to both of them at very similar times because like I said, I responded to that sock puppet account at 8.59 p.m. and then privately messaged Anthony at 9.30 p.m. on that same day. I just find it oddly suspicious that Anthony just decides out of the blue to go looking for me a week and a half within the first time one of my videos quote unquote blow up because now I'm second jewels are. So I say, why? And then they say, I have prolonged fits of daydreaming at times. Just this really, and I know it may not seem scary to some people, but to me, this is so messed up. I 100% believe that this person was in my city looking for me so that they could kill me of these receipts. So unfortunately, yes, some of this is hearsay, but I also have a shit ton of proof that Andrew and Shannon are behind this. Speaking of which, let's move on to Snapchat. One day I just received a completely random Snapchat photograph um, of what looked like a specific square in the city that I lived in with some nonsensical text overlaid on top. I don't have the initial Snapchat because I just kind of froze in panic, but I do have the response to that Snapchat. I wrote, are you in my city? And Kilgore Trout is the name that they chose this time. And they said, somewhere, I suppose, in its labyrinth. And then you can see I started typing back, you are fucking insane. Now, I'm sorry for the ableist language I was using here. I was just, I was so freaked out. You guys have no idea the level of fear that I had in this moment. I was 100% convinced that this person, Andrew or Shannon or whoever, was in my city and they were going to hurt me. You can see I said, answer me. You drove all the way here? And they said, I don't have a driver's license yet. My parents drove me here. Terrifying. Fast forward a year again, I had followed Creep Show Art on Instagram. Scrolling through Instagram one day and I notice a drawing that resembles Andrew because Andrew had a very specific look to him. And I was like, oh, he he, who drew this? What a coinky dink. Creep Show Art. I read the caption and it says something about working with and she tags Andrew and my fucking heart falls out my ass. What's interesting though is at that point, um, I didn't accuse Shannon right away. I was actually, if anything, I was concerned about Shannon. Here and after a few Snapchats sent back and forth about a cryptic and almost troll-like messages, Emily lets the supposed Anthony know that she is aware he is dating Shannon or Creepshow Art. 
it. I want to backtrack a little bit and talk about how I said I had undeniable proof that Andrew was the person stalking me, that he clicked a link and I was able to trace his IP because this was the first time that I had done that. Now, after the Twitter incident where Andrew accused me of supposedly buying subs, I was very suspicious that my stalker up until that point had been Andrew. So I laid out a trap where I sent one of these profiles um, a link uh, pretending to be another like separate hater of mine. And on that link, um, I attached an IP tracker. And because we had mutual friends, I knew exactly where Andrew and Shannon lived. So I sent over the bait, he clicked on the link, and wouldn't you know it, the IP address took me directly to where they were living. What's interesting is back when my Facebook account was hacked, I wasn't aware that Andrew was doing any of this, right? Um, but Facebook had sent me um, an, an email basically saying, um, here is where the unknown login came from. The IP address pointed to the city where Andrew was from and where he resided in at the time. And after everything, I consulted with the lawyer, I went back to the police, I even hired a private investigator for a short time to do some digging. I, one, ran out of money, and two, was advised by the lawyer not to take this to court. That it would be a lengthy court battle, and it's not like justice will be served, because it's really hard to prove that Shannon and Andrew ran all those sock puppet accounts because there was so many of them. And I fully acknowledge that probably not all of those comments were coming from Andrew and Shannon. But when you've been stalked as long as I have, you can detect your stalker's language to the point where I could start to differentiate the voices between Andrew and Shannon. And what's really interesting is it was definitely Andrew in the beginning. Like, I really think Andrew just roped Shannon into this mean girl obsession with me. And Shannon kind of became the mastermind over time. I could see the transition from Andrew into Shannon. Now, whereas Andrew was more kind of threatening and domineering, not that Shannon wasn't, not that Shannon didn't love to make vague threats against me. Um, Shannon was more catty and mean girl. At this point in the timeline, it is believed that some breadcrumbs are laid out for the possibility that Shannon would be outed as Emily Stalker because she made it clear that she knew about Anthony. An example of this is when a Twitter account named Britta Filter contacted Emily claiming that their younger brother, who was now being moved to a facility to receive treatment, was responsible for stalking Emily all these years, and did things such as hack her Facebook and save those illicit pictures. But as these messages continued, they were a bit too specific, along with there being very strange aspects to the story. A strange aspect is that this account claims her brother was 15 at the time these messages were sent in 2018, but Emily's Facebook was fished in 2013, so her brother would have to have been 10 years old and known not only how to fish her Facebook and contact her place of employment to get her fired, her brother would also have to have the same IP as Shannon along with it changing consistently to where she moved. That's when Emily asked for a video chat or something to link this to a real person, as this was all too specific. But according to Emily, the account never provided such a thing. Besides this account, Shannon also posted on her Instagram story in relation to Emily, possibly in an attempt to separate herself from any future claims. As when receiving requests for her to collaborate with Emily, she both denies the possibility of a collaboration and brings up her stalker that, interestingly enough, mimics what she has been allegedly doing to Emily. Another what is considered to be a breadcrumb is when she made a lengthy video talking about her stalker, Amy. Shannon's post reads, The people linking me to Emily Artful's video, I've seen it, and no, it wasn't me. Plays Shaggy in background. I've said multiple times that I won't collaborate with other YouTubers because I don't enjoy the implications people get from it. Even if this isn't what the person is thinking at the time, collaborating with someone is a business move. You gain from that partnership. And I never want to be in a position where someone thinks I owe my following, money, and success because of someone else. That's gross. Also, less exciting, and something I might open up more about, but for about 12 years now, I've been harassed online by the girl who catfishes me. I know it's her because she ended up admitting to it last year when I called her out on it, saying it was because she was stressed and didn't have another outlet for it. Also, she felt betrayed because I stopped responding to her emails after a while. 
Because of her harassing me, my boyfriend, my friends, and sometimes going as far as to try to get me fired, I don't trust people very easily online. Isn't that a coinky dink? That right there is the most passive aggressive shit I have ever read and is also one of the many breadcrumbs that she started leaving behind that she had a quote unquote stalker named Amy. I think it's funny that she picked the name Amy. I think she deliberately picked a name that was very close to mine so that if I ever came out with allegations, she could be like, see, I even chose Amy because it sounds like Emily. And of course she picked all the things that she did to me so then I couldn't even come out if I wanted to, because then it would seem like I was copying her instead of her copying me. Being fed up with this and the breadcrumbs, Emily finally decides to confront her. Is it Andrew? We can be candid now because I know it's one of you. Those fake accounts you've been making have led me right to Oregon. I suspected it was him at first when he went on a spree on his main account on Twitter, trying to convince my followers I bought my subscribers and my views. Almost immediately after he did that, a mysterious new Twitter account accused me of the same thing, also with an IP from that area in Oregon. When I first started to get harassed, you both must still have been in San Jose, because that IP came from somewhere in San Jose. But at the time, I had no idea who it was. But now, over time, in order to protect myself and my family, I decided to get smarter. So I just really don't know if it's you or him. Either way, I've been giving all this information to the police, including the more accurate IP from that Lily Singh account. All I ask is to be left alone by you and your boyfriend. It's been eight years. I also forgot to mention that I baited that Lily Singh account into clicking a link with an IP tracker that led me straight to their new location because they had had since moved. Now, interestingly enough, one of the IPs that I had tracked to where they had lived before was from a library. From here, Shannon takes a similar tactic she used with Hopeless Peaches by claiming the thing was happening to her and other content creators, but fails to mention any other content creator, thus not providing any evidence, which helps her at times lie or bend the truth at her will. Besides that, she was also saying that she was getting similar treatment by her stalker, claiming that her stalker did a similar thing by photoshopping Shannon's face onto a cam girl for the purpose of trying to convince her mom that she was camming. But with all this, Shannon never provides any evidence. As she previously mentioned, she deleted every email when contacting her stalker. And though Emily, within these messages, claims that she's hiring a PI and attempting to get a restraining order against Shannon and Anthony, she later decides against that decision, as maybe after this confrontation it would end. And conveniently, the number of threats, DMs, and random comments, according to Emily, plummeted after this confrontation. I and Shannon. It's hard enough going through what you went through, and we're both more than happy and willing to sign something that says we will not contact you again in any form ever again. And back at you, I'm happy this helps, and happy this made you feel at least a little bit better. It was never my intention to make you feel any which way, but I understand where you're coming from and why you did. Never feel like you have to apologize for that. And I said, thank you so much. Good night. And that was it. After that conversation with Shannon, I never received another threat or taunt again. And that, to me, just further solidified in my mind that my stalker was Shannon and Andrew. That was the summary of Emily's two-hour-long video. A video that two weeks after posting hit around 3 million views. That's more than 200,000 views a day on average. But with this video's views going up, Creepshow subscribers and video views were going down. An interesting aspect about the negative video views is that that happens whenever you private, unlist, or delete a video. Two million views worth of videos were removed from her channel on the day the low-count leaks were posted. It was only two days after they were posted that anyone was truly aware of them. So it is a fascinating coincidence that all these videos were hit from the public eye before most people knew about the accusations, with more videos following suit in the coming days. Some were related to her alleged stalker Amy, and also removed was a video talking about how she approves of the criticisms she receives from Locale. But other videos had no relation to anything being discussed in recent time. The more impactful thing was not the loss in views, but the amount of subscribers she was bleeding. This was an exodus that began shortly after the Locale leaks were outed, starting at the loss of 1,000 a day, which is alarming enough, then peaking at 8,000 a day until Emily's video was released. That number jumped up to above 10,000, where just two weeks after the Locale leaks were brought to light, 
Creepshow had already lost 100,000 subs, or one-fifth of our subscriber base with more on the way. This was not just the result of the low-cow post or Emily's video, but the many content creators coming out against Creepshow at the time. As it happens with most cancelings, this had people with both high association Creepshow and those who hardly had any interaction with her jumping on the trend to give their piece or opinion of the cancelled creator. A byproduct of so much information coming out is there is typically little motivation to vet all information. As with these other accusations coming out, it is understood that if Creepshow could have stalked Emily for several years, then she is capable of much more. Another allegation that got a decent amount of traction was a 22 tweet long Twitter thread of user Coltergeist who met Shannon during their freshman year of college in 2011, where they corroborated that Shannon was stalking Emily through the time that they knew her. Another Twitter thread that focused on Shannon was Shannon's sister, the very same Twitter account that was doxxed via the locale post. Before being privated and later deleted, Shannon's sister did an ask me anything for the various questions that were being tossed at her. Parallel to the tweet's archival in the Wayback Machine are screenshots users saved of the tweets, one user going as far as to archive some of them in a Google Drive. Many of these are not too relevant to us, but this one is in where she further backs the accusations that Shannon was heavily harassing someone several years back through multiple accounts. As for the content creators coming out about their experiences with Shannon, many were being pressured and pestered by viewers to make a video coming out against her mostly because of their association with her. This is something that is echoed in many videos discussing Shannon at this time, as many delay talking about her for a variety of reasons. The most reoccurring seems to be that they wanted to wait until some of the dust settled because these allegations were so damning. And in relation to that, there were many creators that Shannon never insulted through Locale, and might have genuinely cared for. So it was difficult for many to come out with their experiences against Shannon, as they had to pin this negative side of her with the positive one they experienced. Some creators, like Ready to Glare, initially came out in her defense, but retracted her claims after severe backlash and after looking further into the situation. But before Shannon cut contact with creators by changing her private number and disabling her Instagram account, on an Instagram story, she was claiming to leave the internet and come back when she was able to prove that she was innocent without a shadow of a doubt, doing so by legal means. Also saying that she realized what a lot of what she thought were friendships were not, as she was seeing many content creators she once supported now opposing her. But also, to many content creators in private, she was asking them not to defend her, and not to become attached to the situation, as many content creators and viewers alike wanted to believe this was not her. It's insane. This ended up in another back and forth, which led her to telling me to just forget her and not associate with her to prevent people from attacking me online. And frankly, that pissed me off because I was already being attacked online over her. That made me overall just really done with the situation, which I told her and I let her know she had my number if she needed anything, but I was done with it. After I later found out that Tipster had asked her the same thing and Shannon told him essentially she didn't trust he wouldn't leak the information despite them being friends, I don't regret bowing out when I did. Like, just alarm bells were ringing. What she told me is that she didn't want me or anyone else defending her. Now, a lot of people are comparing this to the John Swan situation. And while there is lying to friends' faces involved, this is a little bit different than John Swan. And I'll tell you why. John Swan lied to our faces and allowed us to go out on a limb and defend him. So when it inevitably came out that he was lying, uh, it all blew up in our faces and we all caught shit for it. Creepshow is a little bit different. Creepshow is openly telling us, do not defend me. Now, I take two things from this statement. One, I think she knows she's lying and that's why she doesn't want us to defend her because she knows that we will catch shit uh, if we defend her and the truth eventually comes out, right? But the other thing I take from this is that she saw what happened in the John Swan situation. She saw that we got shit for defending John. And even though she's lying to our faces as our friends, she actually does care about us a little bit. And so she's telling us not to defend her because she knows the truth is going to come out eventually. 
As for her intention, she could have been requesting this as if the content creators were to defend her, they would get much flack, which she wanted to avoid them going through. That is the more positive perspective, though the negative one suggests that she is guilty and knows her actions are irredeemable. So if she were to have these content creators fall in her place, then it would look even worse on her if she admitted to being guilty of these actions. And while she stayed true to her word that she would impose, she didn't do so publicly. But she did reactivate her Instagram account to respond to Tipster, a new style content creator who prior to this event had association with her. To provide more context, Anthony, Shannon's husband, YouTube channel was discovered, which is when he deleted all the content off the channel and changed the name to Alan Wake, where Tipster posted a question in the discussion tab, asking, why did you delete all your videos and rename the channel? This is a question that Tipster posed in July. But that's when, now in August, Creepshow seemingly broke her streak of silence to respond to Tipster on Instagram a little over two weeks after he tried to reach out to her again to hear her side of the story, which is when she responded and accused Tipster of perpetuating these accusations against her boyfriend that he awarded Emily. Look at it. This is the YouTube channel, which was later, like, after this controversy kind of went down. Um, they removed all the content from the channel. And then on top of that, they renamed the channel. And so I simply asked in the comments, why did you delete all your videos and rename the channel? That's it. That's, that's all I said. This is back in uh, July uh, 17th. So this was like a day or two after they reactivated their Instagram. And I said, I don't know if you're reading messages here. And yes, I have been publicly critical of you and stand by what I said, but I'm still here if you need to talk. And initially, I didn't get a response uh, from that. So I just kind of like figured I'd wait like a day or two and see like, do I get a response here? And uh, I didn't get a response. So I just kind of assumed like, okay, they're not reading DMs. Or if they're reading DMs, they're not responding to them. Whatever. No big deal. But I got a response last night or rather this morning at 1.11 a.m. You want to talk, you want me to talk to you after you commented on my husband's channel because of a provably false rape accusation. Really? You thought that was smart? Okay. That sounds like a very serious claim to make about me. Makes it seem like not only did I leave a comment on their husband's channel, but it was like a horrible one, right? Though Tipster explains that he only discussed and labeled them as accusations. But she also accuses him of going after her husband publicly when all Tipster did is pose a question that got a little traction. Which amongst other things, like saying that there is obvious evidence clearing his name when there is none. This is a tactic she used in opposition against Hopeless Peaches and Emily. But this entire exchange shows how defensive she is when it comes to her husband. And while the momentum and motivation to discuss Creepshow slowed down, discussion of her still persisted. Especially when leaked audio logs where Shannon says that Gabby Hanna is bad at manipulating came out. Ugh. My issue with Gabby is she is not good at being manipulative. At all. Some viewers took this as, since Creepshow is saying Gabby Hanna is bad at manipulating, Shannon might know how to properly manipulate. But it could also just very well be an observation. Though now due to everything coming out, most commentators and viewers had an ever-souring opinion of Creepshow. During the same month, Emily made a follow-up video on August 21st, 2021 titled, Creepshow Art Did Not Work Alone. A large part of this follow-up is proving the legitimacy of the DMs showcased in a previous video via showing them on her phone and scrolling through them, as it would be more difficult to fake such screenshots with this new proven layer. This video mostly showed additional archive screenshots between her and Anthony, along with further proof that links him to being her stalker. Nothing too major, but it did hammer the point that the focus should not be entirely on Shannon. And on the same note, and after this, the focus around Shannon seemed to have died down, with videos discussing her popping up every now and then, there was not much to keep the momentum going as she still hadn't come back to posting or uploading videos, with her last video uploaded on June 6, which was not in relation to any of the ongoing drama. That was until December, which was four months after Emily's most recent video, 
where on New Year's Eve, Shannon uploaded an about two and a half long video titled, The Lies of Emily Artful, parentheses with evidence. This was based on a 90 page document she wrote up. And looking at this video, it is typical for a video made after a scandal to have larger ratio of dislikes to likes. But it is rare to find a video that performed as poorly as Shannon's. Receiving 71,000 dislikes and only 2,300 likes, this video failed terribly in many respects. At most, it helped prove that Shannon nor Anthony was behind the Snapchat user Kilgore Trout that sent Emily random Snapchats about a mind-bending, thumb-bending video as it was discovered that many other creators were receiving such messages sourced to a video attempting to go viral via these cryptic and bothersome messages. But the thing is, many of Shannon's claims were not substantiated, like claiming that she wasn't involved in making Emily lose her job. An example of this weak linkage is as follows. Shannon says it couldn't have been them that got Emily fired from her job because she wasn't camming at the time and there were videos of her nude around the internet. Their sole source to prove that she wasn't camming around this time is a Twitter account that tweeted for a period in 2014. And with that, they somehow have an absolute certainty that it was not probable that Emily could have later established this Twitter for her camming account and just had to establish it alongside it. Shannon seems certain in her videos, but Emily is cautious when making these claims and does often say that they were possibly not involved in much of the harassment in her own original video, as it's difficult to verify that many of these accounts had any involvement with Anthony or Shannon beyond speculation. Emily is also open about her past, where, by her own words, she was a terrible person that did terrible things, but has improved upon herself. And that's a large part of Shannon's new video, what should have been a video focusing on disproving the locale allegations and proving that Amy exists. Instead, this is a video that dedicates about two hours to Emily's past, dating all the way back from middle school and is attempting to make Emily an uncredible figure now for her actions 16 years ago. Reports of 18 people of abusing her in her life, including her own parents. She later retracted most of these claims and now states they're all loving. In her first DeviantArt profile under the name Gothic Kazooie, which is clearly her as seen in this picture, Emily talks about stalking her teacher in various posts, something she admits to doing in her video uploaded in 2016 titled My 7th Grade Flip Flu. Fun fact, I had a fucking huge crush on my teacher. It's just embarrassing and shameful. So you'll see him randomly in here. In the video, she says that this was harmless. However, it was clearly not. She makes a fan character out of her teacher, who she named Gizmo, takes photos of him without knowing, which she then states he told her to delete, calls him sexy, states she loves him, draws him sexually, and after feeling upset by him being cold towards her, posts a journal in which she says he, quote, emotionally raped her for not returning her feelings. And though she developed this video after six months, with what seems to be with her partner, which may have divulged and helped with the history of Emily, many question how she got such detailed information that does not pertain to her current character. As for the other 30 minutes, that can be chopped up to 10 minutes of old random videos talking about Emily in a bathtub, which is how she may have gotten fired from her job, about two minutes dedicated to Amy, where she only shows random emails from 2006 as proof of her existence, and 10 minutes where she talks about the eroded relationship with her and her sister and how her sister is lying as she never wants to see her again in any capacity, as well as her ex-friend from college that backed up Emily's claims that Shannon was stalking her. That seems to be Shannon's strategy throughout the video. It was to discredit those attacking her rather to focus on the actual allegations against her, as she attempted to draw parallels with Emily's past actions and how she'd accuse others and make her out to be a sort of serial accuser. As for the last nine minutes or so, those can be dedicated to other ramblings that only brought on more opposition against her. Like the last minute of the video where she both attacks Tipster while addressing what she meant when she said don't defend me and also attacking her fans for reaching out to her. This is for him. Tipster said that if I was able to prove that I didn't do what I was being accused of that he would apologize to me. And to that I say fuck you. You disgusting person. You maliciously attacked my husband because you yourself couldn't scroll down far enough on Emily's Instagram and find the multiple posts that debunk her story that are still live. There's, you, you're a journalist, but you just couldn't do that. There is a reason your content gets fewer 
and fewer views than everyone else in the YouTube commentary community, and you keep being beat out by everyone else. And that's because it's terrible, lazy, and reductive. You should rename your channel Secondhand News because you can't be fucked to actually research anything before you open your ugly mouth. You watch someone else's video and you say what they said worse than they said it. You aren't a reporter. You're not a journalist. You're a joke. Just know that you are a terrible person and you can take that forgiveness and <laughs> just fuck it. Just fuck that forgiveness right off. You are just as bad as Emily, if not worse, for supporting a mob with no evidence while claiming to do all this research and claiming to care about your friends or anything. I talked to you so many times and you once cried on stream saying, if Shannon was in trouble, she would tell me not to defend her because she's a good person. And when I told you not to do that, you were like, well, that's sign she's guilty. Even though there's evidence to say I'm not and no evidence to say I am. To the people who reached out who said, I don't care if you did it. I love, still love your content. Don't leave YouTube. I love you. Um, you're weird. Don't, don't say that to me ever fucking again. Do not reach out to me ever again. That is not comforting. I <laughs> spent all my time trying to help victims of what I was actually accused of and to be told that my audience doesn't care about that is insane. Um, to the people, who told me to kill myself. Um, better luck next time. Thanks for playing. And to everyone else, go touch some fucking grass. I am done. I am fucking done. Even worse was the description of this video. The first sentence sending an aggressive tone with, I want to thank my legal team, family, and no one else. She goes on to call everyone lazy and uses the description to exhibit the same behavior of her alleged locale post by divulging greater secrets. Repsion, who was previously confident in his video that Shannon didn't leak what he told her in confidence, may have been surprised to see that Shannon now did so directly in her description. Now for the community reaction. Many took Shannon's lengthy sanction on Emily as extremely detailed, but not in a good way. As many saw it, there was even weaker evidence for Shannon to prove her innocence. Many commentators memeing on this with comments that read, quote, I didn't stalk her, but I know the colors of the walls in her dad's house, unquote. Or quote, when Emily was a baby, she didn't even change her own diapers. She made her parents do it. As you can see, that is highly manipulative and selfish behavior, unquote. And quote, when Emily was a child, she didn't like broccoli. This proves how ungrateful and manipulative she is as a person." Unquote. Content creators had similar responses to Shannon's video. This clip by Edwin's generation seems to be one of the most popular. What? She stated in her now deleted video about how she did a sociopath and that she was misdiagnosed as bipolar. This is so... And on Facebook? Shannon is saying on Facebook in 2009, 2009 13 years <laughs> minus 19, she was 16, 17 or so maybe? Yeah, okay. Why does Shannon have a post from 13 years ago? 11 years ago, that says on the thing for the comments. So, so like, she took this screenshot how long ago? Like two or three years ago. Yeah. Or four, so maybe. She, I don't fucking know. I so can't do math right now. through a shit for a while. You're right. That's a really good point. Shannon took this screenshot, not not this year, not last year, not two years ago, but three years ago, bro. She's held on to Bro, this gets worse and worse. Shannon, Shannon. Shannon, you three remember, you're trying to like present the narrative that you're not a stalker, but girl, why do you have this screenshot? This is so- There's also a leaked version of Shannon's 90 page document that adds an additional 22 pages where she is more vitriolic, which has entertained many creators with her not yet redacted ramblings. But of more importance to us is the first statement in Shannon's video, where she claimed that her response, as we see it, means one of two things. She was able to get Emily to retract some statements, or she took Emily to court. As we see with Emily's final response video, posted a little over a month later on February 8th, 2022, we now know that Shannon opened her video with a lie. As of this video, Emily has not been taken to court, nor has she been forced to retract any of her statements. Video pops up. 
Shannon starts off her video by saying this. If you are seeing this video, it means one of two things has happened. Either one, my lawyers negotiated with Emily's lawyers and we reached a private settlement, which resulted in some form of retraction. Or two, I took Emily to court for defamation and came out the other side. Neither of these things have happened. It's a flat out lie. I have no idea why she chose to leave this in, but I'm kind of glad she did because it gives us a peek into what was probably her overall plan. Also, this is the last video we'll be covering as this is as far as the situation has developed. And what Emily's final video towards Shannon essentially is, is poking holes in Shannon's theories and discoveries as Shannon took many of Emily's old social media posts at face value, including the ones that were made when Emily was 13. That beyond hardly holding any relevance, Shannon decided to cover them anyway. She took posts I made as a child, a mentally ill child that was going through constant and drastic psych medication changes, evaluations, as well as multiple misdiagnoses. And she used this information to attempt to smear me now as an adult. Because as we all know, the things we do as children directly relate to the kind of adult we will become. So if you were dramatic on the internet when you were 12, then that must make you a liar as an adult. Hey, it was way more important that she got back to the DeviantArt journals from when I was 13. Oh, and analyzing the colors of the walls in my childhood home. That stuff is important. There were so many missteps in Shannon's video, Emily did not have too much of a difficult job with winning the audience over again. Though Emily does fail to mention the few of Shannon's valid claims, where she proves it wasn't her stalking her through Snapchat, there was hardly any need, as Shannon's own video was already damning enough and it made it even harder to disprove the overall argument that Shannon wasn't stalking Emily to some capacity. Now with things caught up, we can go into theories as to why things played out the way they did. These are very speculative and may not reflect her accurately, so it is advised to take what you're about to hear with a grain of salt. First, why did Shannon think this video was a good idea? Well, that's a hard situation to comprehend unless you're going through it. According to Shannon, she has lived a very difficult life and has a very negative worldview. She makes enemies with people she's supposed to be close to, like her friends and sister. According to her, achieved normalcy throughout her years in public school, which are very important years for development. Even when she became somewhat of a more social person, she still frames these years as people being against her rather than accepting that her social skills failed her. So she grew up to be a very pessimistic and angry person, dropping out of college and taking a leap of faith to move to an expensive city only to become homeless for three years and struggle even more, which is when she started her channel and was open in her story times about being an asshole or toxic person who hates being around people. Typically, when someone sees himself as bad, they have done what they believe to be bad things. And if they have the view that other people are bad or equally worse, then that means the majority of people are doing bad things and hiding it like her. Overall, a dangerous perspective to have. This may have been a way to relieve guilt for the things she was allegedly doing. But as the years progressed and she got a big break with YouTube, things changed for the better in her life. Winning this lottery may have changed her perspective, as she was on the way to becoming a less vitriolic person, which reflects both her posting less on LolCow and also, coincidentally, Emily being harassed less. She even cites in a video how awful she felt whenever she was first starting YouTube in comparison to her success now. I do not and do not want to go back to the person I was when I made those videos. But just as her life was seeing improvement, she was dragged down for betraying many of those close to her for anonymously posting on LolCow and, of course, the Emily situation. Her taste at a good life, which she never expected, faded as she was returning to the person she once was and fully embodied that malicious person in her final video that focuses more on tearing down others than proving her innocence. But she could be a victim as well which is where we get into another theory. We've gone over Shannon believing that she's a terrible person, which is possibly done to alleviate some guilt. So if people found out about her history, which they did, she was being honest to some extent. There's also the part where she was telling other creators, don't defend me. This can be perceived as her not wanting her friends to go down with her as she is innocent, but it can also be perceived as a way of her communicating that she may be guilty and deserves for her actions to be brought out to light as a form of self-harm but also to relieve herself of the guilt she was bearing. And finally, her final video, where she focused so much on Emily, did not go beyond three minutes to try to prove Amy's existence nor address the locale posts. 
While a comment she left under the video does say that she'd rather focus on the serious claims Emily laid out, there is also the truth that Amy and the long call post are only tied to Shannon and not Anthony. The way things are laid out and addressed always seem to be done in relation to his defense. Her only time communicating with someone during her long period of silence was to tipster, and that was in defense of her husband. What if she wants to come clean, but doing so will also drag her loved one down? Someone she spent three years living out of two cars with, and forming such a close-knit bond, there is not even a thought of betrayal. She can ignore those accusations leveled at her solely because they are just at her. But when any of them implicate Anthony, she fights hard not just in his defense, but also gets the attention back on her. But again, this is all just a theory, and this is still an evolving situation. There might be a chance that she can somehow sever her connections to the locale posts, and if she does, then she both gains credibility with Amy and that she was telling the truth in some capacity. This domino effect will also give her more credibility with the Emily situation and things can go in her favor. But it has to start there, and unless she is able to sever that thread, she will find difficulty ever finding success online. But only time will tell, as more information needs to come out. These are accusations with many, many coincidences. Like that she's dating the same person Emily did. She started off with not only the same content style, but the exact same name for it. And there are many parallels with her alleged stalker and Emily's alleged stalker. But again, these could just be coincidences. Many, many coincidences. Even though the things that Shannon did to me were unconscionable and cruel, I believe that she was also a victim here. I believe that Anthony played on her hatred for me, as well as her emotional dependence on him. For God's sake, she dropped everything to go live out of her car, an experience she herself called absolutely miserable, just to be with him. I will never forgive or forget what Shannon did to me, and her being a victim doesn't excuse her horrible behavior, but I do think it's important we acknowledge that.